Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today, we're very excited to have two special guests with us today, Stephen Tang of Dry Fruit and Joanne Tabalea Murphy of Walmart. Joanne and Stephen, welcome to the show. Hi. Hello. Great to be here. Of course. We're excited to both have you both in the show, but today we're going to focus our attention on Stephen so Stephen, tell us your story and what was your inspiration to start Drunk Fruit? So Drunk Fruit is an Asian-inspired hard seltzer. Um, since then, our company has also expanded to creating other Asian-inspired alcohols. Um, I was in uh, I was an immigrant. I was born in Shanghai, China. My parents immigrated to the US when I was four. Uh, and I've always had that connection to my culture through food and beverage. When I was growing up, I was one of just a few Asian kids in my neighborhood. Uh, but the connection I always had to my identity was through food and beverage. Um, so my co-founder, Ken and I, um, we've always been known for making drinks for our friends in, in college. Uh, we'd always make cocktails. One that we were especially known for was a uh, yogurt soju. So after graduating, me and my co-founder kind of went our separate ways. Um, but we've always kept in touch, always been... Uh, talking about uh, our heritage and our food and our culture. So uh, during the pandemic, we've just, just started this as kind of a side project. So Ken and I were just messing around in our own kitchens, just trying to make different types of drinks. Uh, and we saw that hard seltzer was kind of on the rise. And so we were just in our kitchens trying to mix seltzers with the Asian beverages that we got from the Asian grocery store. Like we went to 99 Ranch, got all the beverages that we loved, mix it with seltzers and we've actually created something just in our kitchens uh, as a, a fun project to start off with. Um, and it kind of got organically picked up by a lot of local craft beer places. Um, so like we kind of sent our samples around to different stores in the area and there was so much like organic traction that we thought we had something. Uh, and so we kind of grew it from there. But in the beginning, it was just a fun thing for me and my friend to do during the pandemic. And we were literally just messing around with it in our own kitchens to start off with. I love that. What was the catalyst for you for you guys at one point to realize, hey, like instead of making this a side business, let's make this our main business. What was that conversation like? How much you don't want me asking, like how much time and commitment did you make to this and be like, hey, if this does a certain amount of sales, we're gonna leave our job and do this full time. What was that conversation like to convert this from side hustles to full time hustle? So that was really tough because both of us, uh, both of us had good paying jobs in tech. So Ken and I both come from a tech background. Um and we thought this was going to be a side hustle for like for indefinitely. Um, so the 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 kind of the catalyst is it's hard to pinpoint an exact time. Um, I would say uh, there's a couple things like one, there's just a feeling in your gut that like this, there's something there. Right. There's a feeling in your gut that like there's actually a market opportunity and that there's pe people actually really want this. So that's the first thing is like we. We saw just from like how many, uh, how much traction we were getting, like the the excitement from the customers, the excitement from the retailers, uh, people like Walmart coming on and showing interest in our products. Um, all that spoke to us. And we almost resisted at first because we originally came into this wanting to keep it just as a side hustle. But we had so much um, interest from the retailers and the customers that we thought like, if we run this to actually work out, we have to go full time. Um, and I think it, it comes to that point for a lot of entrepreneurs that I've talked to. Um, it's kind of just like a, a leap of faith in your gut. Like there's no like really rational reason. Cause like for me, if I thought about it rationally, I came to an answer every time that I shouldn't quit my job. Um, just like based on economics and like risk factors. But, um, I think it was just more of a feeling in my gut that like, I think there's something here and, um, there's really no way to find out except if I go full time. I love that. I love that a lot. And I you know compared to the other Asian like hard seltzer brands out there, I feel like you guys are the most word of mouth organic marketing. All right. I seem some pretty aggressive marketing right. so far. So I really appreciate that. I really appreciate how grassroots you guys are. Like that definitely like I'm starting to see more and more like drunk fruit supporting other Asian organizations during their events. So thank you so much for doing that. And I want to throw the question to Joanne real quick. Um, Joanne, can you tell us about the first time you met dr the drunk fruit team? <laughs> well, I will tell you, I mean, they're a lot of fun, right? But, um, we met through a mutual friend, um, or acquaintance and, um, who told us, who told me, Oh, by the way, this great, cool group of founders just, um, applied to open call Walmart, Walmart's open call. And uh, Joanne, you really need to meet them. So we, it was like right around the pandemic and we were doing everything via Zoom, right? 
And um, so we got on a Zoom call and uh, the energy level between these founders and their team was just really incredible. Um, Talk about risk taking and linking in playfulness, not corporate like at all. You guys didn't come across Stephen as corporate like at all. And, And I love that because it fits with the brand, right? Um, so anyway, yeah, that's how, that's how we met. <laughs> it was fun. Well, that's amazing. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, what Steven was like as a young budding entrepreneur and, you know, what his personality was like? Did you see a lot of potential in him? Talk about that. Well, goodness, you know, it's kind of hard to do over zoom, right? <laughs> but I will say that, um, each one of them has their, a different personality. And I picked up on that pretty quick. Steven, um, can be even now, I mean, it's been what, three years, Stephen, maybe that, that I first met you all. And, uh, I've seen, um, v- very experienced seasoned, um, a very experienced seasoned person now coming into the scene. Um, and St- Stephen was kind of quiet but for a marketing guy. Cause my background is in marketing for a marketing guy that's a little bit unusual um, to have that um, quiet kind of all knowing wise Yoda kind of look. (laughs) That's what I would say, Stephen. But um, yeah, I I feel like, uh, like um, he's really grown into his own and the confidence is really cool to see. Stephen is driven and he's got energy. So um, that's kind of, what the changes that I've seen. I love that. Yeah. For some people, you can just tell immediately through their personality, just the way that they shine. And I love that you had a very, very good first impression of Steven. Uh, So Steve, I'm going to bounce the question back to you again. And you ended off the last question off with talking about, you know, when you decided it was time to make the jump, right? And you started off in tech. Talk a little bit about your background and what the transition was like for you switching from being a product manager to a full-time entrepreneur, because I know you've worked at some really notable companies like Instagram, Twitch, um, and just the feeling of kind of like detaching yourself away from that position, I'm sure it must have taken a lot. So I want to hear about your experience about that as well. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Joanne, for saying those things about me. Actually, the the whole marketing thing that you said um, kind of relates to this question because yeah, I never planned to be a marketer. Um, I don't didn't know anything about marketing when I when we first met. Um, and I think I approached marketing from a, a, a standpoint of my previous experiences um, in tech. And so, like a lot of things that I think we do are unconventional. Um, and so, like yeah, even me, I think as a marketer is not a traditional type of uh, a marketing person that you meet, but I hope that actually kind of plays to our strengths. Um, so um, our my background was in tech. I spent the last seven years before doing this company um, at, um, at large companies and tech startups. I've worked at Instagram, Twitch, as well as like a handful of smaller tech startups. Um, making the, the transition to consumer brands and starting my own alcoholic beverage company, totally nothing I, I ever expected of myself. Um, but it's been really, really fun. Uh, I think the first big difference is that, um, working on a tangible product makes, I feel it for me, at least makes me have a much greater connection to the work that I'm doing and seeing people's reactions when they actually get to crack open a can and drink it is really just really magical. Um, for me, the transition, um, I I think I've had to do what I I call a lot of more like boots on the ground kind of work. Uh, I've had to learn how to drive, drive a forklift. I've had to learn how to, you know, work with warehouse workers and, um, you know, uh, a lot more, uh, a lot more like in store trying to sell people, trying to, to, uh, talk to store managers and build relationships. When I was in tech, I could do a lot of work just from my computer and from the, the comfort of my own home. But, uh, I think with the consumer brand like this, I've really had to go out into the real world, as I would say, and, uh, learn how a lot of the real world work. So I'm really grateful actually that I've been able to see this side of, uh, the I would see this side of the economy. I think a lot of the the U.S. economy actually works like this, um, where we uh, have people doing logistics and people doing warehouse work and people doing production uh, manufacturing in a way that, I, like, as a person in tech, I never saw. So um, I'm actually really grateful to have had the experience. And the transitions actually not been as challenging as I thought it would be. Um, I think it's like 
for, for me, I think like work is just work. You've kind of figure out, um, what your goals are, um, like figure out how to achieve those goals. Like the methods of achieving the goals in this industry are very different from tech, but at the end of the day, like the way business gets done is actually still very similar. So, uh, the transition hasn't been that crazy. Yeah. Me. I mean, that's really great to hear. Cause I know that, you know, I, I come from a tech background as well. And I know that having a product management background is tremendous because essentially your, your own, you own the product, you own the vision, you execute it, you make sure everyone gets done. You know, so I can see there's a lot of transferable skills that fell into yeah. you know, founder itself. So congratulations on that. Totally. Yeah. I think it's at the end of the day, it's the same. I think people think, you know, tech is so different from other industries. I think the people who are building the products are thinking about the same things. They're thinking about what the consumer wants. They're thinking about how the consumer interacts with the product, how it makes them feel. Um, and distribution. Well, I think if I had to highlight one big difference, distribution is the biggest difference between tech and physical products. Like I kind of took the distribution power of software for granted when I was there. Um, distribution is a lot more manual, I would say, in the consumer world. Um, but um aside from that yeah it's you know people are just trying to make products that people want really and that's that's the same across all industries yeah definitely i have a question regarding that too so when you first started your company did you guys bootstrap your company or did you guys raise the fundraising round already we bootstrapped in the beginning um so it was all uh, founder funded for say the first year um and then when we had to start scaling um we started expanding into like multiple states we did get a round of friends and family funding. Um, so right now we're still, uh, yeah, we're and then institutional wise, we've taken um, like just a small amount of money. So we're largely still uh, friends and family and founder funded. Oh, wow. I mean, just, I know there's a lot of founders inside our network that, you know, obviously being Asian American or just being Asian in general, ask, the idea of asking for money is like unheard of. Right to be like to, <laughs> to your parents, your friends, asking for money. Everyone, everyone always seems very skeptical. How did you? What advice do you have for someone who's just starting out, looking to fundraise money and asking for friends and family money? How did you approach this this problem? Well, um, I think it's kind of like a search problem. Um, I, I, we start trying to find everyone that we can talk to, um, and most people, um, I, I, at least that I found, um, most people are willing to talk to you if you're building a company because just because people like talking to founders and like talking to people doing interesting work. So, um, in the beginning, we just reached out to our network and, um, like sent people samples to try. And, you know, it, in the most cases, like they really liked it and they would really believe in us because they knew us as I mean, my co-founder as people who were hardworking and that they trusted, um, they were willing to give us funds because just because of those two reasons. Uh, and I think in the beginning, um, there's not much like traction or metrics to base an investment off of. So a lot of friends and family for us was just because they like us and they knew us and they wanted to support our journey and they wanted to like be there along with us for that journey. Um, so it wasn't really that much, even that much about financial return for a lot of our friends and family. It's just about supporting us as people. Um, so that's the way we approach it. And that's kind of when, once you get to institutional money, of course, the, the metrics matter a lot more, but um, if you're just starting out, um, just looking for friends and family, I think if you can get them to believe in you, get them to believe in that, that you have a vision, that you have an idea of where you want to take the company, um, that seems to have been enough for us. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, like Brian mentioned, I know that a lot of founders feel very skeptical, like they don't want to ruin relationships with their friends and family. But, mm -hmm. you know, the the reality is that your friends and family are going to be your biggest supporters, right? If they really believe totally, in yeah. what you're doing. And as long as you do what you, you say you're going to do, and these friends and family, they're going to be really following your journey if they're going to be putting money into it, right? But also want to support you on the sidelines. And so friends and family is always going to be like the first place that you should always go to. because They're going to be your, your biggest cheerleaders and your biggest supporters. So Agreed. We want to know a little bit more about your journey, just starting Drunk Fruit. And up until now, you know, being an entrepreneur, obviously there's highs and lows and there's always fires every single day. Um, but throughout the last couple of years, just building Drunk Fruit, what has been your biggest setback? So I, I think the biggest setbacks for us have been um, on the on the operations, like figuring out how to do logistics, which was a very new area for us. Um, and we didn't realize at the time how big of a, cost like operations issues would amount to us but i think 
um, it seems to be actually kind of common across like consumer products. Um, so the first, for one example I can, I can readily point to is, um, in the beginning when we were first doing our first production batch, um, it was still during the height of the pandemic. It was like the late, late 2020s. Um, and the co-packer that we had used to, uh, to produce our first batch, they had agreed to produce it for us in sometime like in April. Uh, but because of the pandemic, um, and, and like everything shutting down, they had to really constrain their operations. And, um, they decided that they were just going to produce hand sanitizer at their facilities instead of producing any alcohol. Um, so things like that, like we could have never anticipated, um, and that set back our launch date by six months. Um, so like we launched in October, 2020, we're supposed to launch in April of 2020 because, um, because of the pandemic, we were delayed about six months. Um, and so like that, those kind of issues, um, still persist even to this day, even though we're a larger operation, like something doesn't taste quite right. And like, we have like really high standards for what it should taste like. And so we have to you know, destroy like a whole bunch of product that doesn't meet our standards. That still happens on the operation side. Um, we lose products during shipping. Um, so I, I'll say like these operational setbacks are kind of like little paper cuts that build up over time. Um, those are probably the the biggest setbacks and the hardest ones for us to, to overcome. Yeah, that's extremely hard. And even if you get the sample, right, and it's like exactly how you would like it, maybe there's something that changed when they're going through production. So you can never expect it. And yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, it got pushed back. It's something that we would never expect it. And pandemic was something that none of us had expected. And that probably set a lot of us back as entrepreneurs. Um, so thanks for sharing that. And hopefully, you know, things have gotten a little bit more smooth now. But as an entrepreneur, we all know that there's always ups and downs. <laughs> so Joanne, I want to bounce the question back to you and talk a little bit about Walmart Open Call. So one of Drunk Fruit's entrepreneurial milestones was participating in Walmart Open Call. And for our listeners who are not familiar with Walmart Open Call and who would be interested uh, in learning about the opportunity, Joanne, can you tell us a little bit about the Walmart Open Call, what it is and how entrepreneurs can participate in it? Yeah, sure. And I really appreciate, thanks for asking. Um, and Drug Fruit like fits the bill perfectly. They're a perfect example of what Open Call is about. So this is our 10th year. Um, 10th anniversary for Open Call. And it's an opportunity where um, we can really feature, you know, entrepreneurs, small businesses who create manufacturer products to sell on our shelves, sell on.com. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to really have face-to-face -face access if they get through the, the um, different processes through the journey and really have face-to-face -face contact with those um, buyers and be able to pitch and demonstrate their, their excitement and their energy and um, what their, why their, their product is so good, right? Why their products um, are something that fills a gap in our business um, and why customers will want to buy it. Drug fruit is, fits the bill perfectly. Um, Open Call was created originally and still is about offering our customers, Walmart customers, um, more products made in the U.S. Um, that are grown or assembled um, here and, um, and creating jobs. So this year, we've actually moved um, the date, and it's going to be an uh, open call pitch day will be in October, um, October 24th and 25th. So the way this works is um, we're in the middle of application season right now. So um, July 18th through August 18th is um, when you can apply. Anybody can apply. And um, when you apply, I, I'm sure that Stephen has some tips about what that needs to look like. Um, because he's gone through it before. But when you apply, um, the more the more passion you show and write in your application, um, you know, buyers can feel it. Readers can feel that. People can feel that. It's just like marketing and advertising, right? They can feel that kind of en positive energy. And um, that's really what turns people's heads as well as the quality these um, products that people um, are offering in their applications to participate in open call are beyond the concept ideation stage. 
They are already set in stone. That they already have been um, got, been manufactured, um, and so the, they're ready to go. Now you don't have to be at the point of supplying 4,700 stores, Walmart stores, and you know hundreds, thousands of Sam Clubs. Um, you can apply in different ways. If you go to www.corporate.walmart.com and look up Open Call, you can see where the applications are. And it's easy to read, easy to find. Um, what's important to know, too, um, Maggie, is that um, there are different ways that you can get your foot in the door at Walmart. Open Call is one of them. Another one is supplyon.com. Um, and another way is it's all about relationships and building a relationship with your local store manager and getting them to hoping, you know, talking to them about what your products are and offering, for instance, to put a display up on their floor and um, making sure that you're the one who works the display, replenishes it, talks to the customers about how cool their your item is um, and why it's so different and, and why it's a, a plus up from where they're already at. Those are the kinds of things that you can do to really um, push your product into our stores, into .com, into Sam's Clubs. Okay, wow, that is a lot of really helpful information for anyone who's interested. Um, and the good thing is that, you know, Walmart, it literally has everything. And so I feel like it's such an open space where any entrepreneur, whatever they or they may be, you know, starting or creating, um, this is like an open space for everyone and it's an opportunity for everyone. So thanks so much for sharing that. Um, Stephen, on that topic, uh, it is Walmart's 10 year anniversary of Open Call. So can you share a little bit about the event and what the process was like for you? I know Joanne mentioned that you have some tips and tricks and how did your pitch for Walmart go? Um, and especially why did you choose Walmart out of any other supermarket? The, the open pro call process was actually surprisingly easy. Um, we did an application online and I think part of it, we had to submit like a, a little pitch video of uh, talking about our product and the founder and our stories behind our product. Um, after that, it was very, very structured. Um, so we got a call back. Um, we found someone from our category to guide us through the process. So like Walmart facilitates all of that. Um, they'll connect you to the right person. And then, and then you start talking to the category buyer for your products. So in our case, alcoholic beverages and beer. Um, and from there, um, at the, uh, you have, uh, like a couple of weeks, uh, to prepare like a final pitch. Um, and there it's kind of like pitching investors or pitching, um, a store retailers. Um, you make a pitch, we made a pitch deck and then uh, presented to the buyer, gave them samples. And from there, they decided which ones would make it through to the, the final rounds and ultimately onto the shelves. So it was a matter of just preparing at each step and Walmart guided us through each step. Um, so it was actually relatively simple for us. Um, and I think we were lucky to have a smooth process and uh, lucky to have a buyer that was really organized and um, guided us through the process. And of course, like Joanne also was a huge help there. Um, but I think for, for us, it was just um, got going through the process and following like to taking the steps that Walmart wants you to take um, and then telling your story articulately and in a way that resonates with the people that are making the decisions at Walmart. I love that. Yeah. And like Joanne mentioned, you know, you can really tell when uh, a, a brand or an entrepreneur is being genuine, right? And we, like Brian and I, we know that specifically for AHN, like so many people are telling their stories and you can immediately tell when someone is just trying to promote their product in AHN or if they really want to inspire and just tell their stories. So I love that Walmart was able to pick up on your guys' story. Um, so thank you for sharing those tips and tricks. Of course. Awesome. I know we're near the end of the podcast. So I want to throw a question to both you guys, actually. I want to start with Joanne first. Uh, Joanne, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs who are trying to get their products on Walmart shelves? Yeah, well, you know, some of it is what I just shared with you. Um, another thing, and, and this is something that many entrepreneurs do already. You talk, Maggie talked about, you know, passion and being authentic and so forth. Um, some of the entrepreneurs who have gotten like golden tickets on the spot kind of offerings. Um, now we do it in person in the buildings in Bentonville, Northwest Arkansas. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's about also how, how they participate in the community. 
right? So some businesses, um, and I think drunk, drunk fruit's one of them, where, um, you know, there's a portion of, of what you do and you give back to the community or you support um, underserved members of the community, 501c3s, nonprofits, um, that's the genuine, authentic care about your customers, about your community. I, I really think that that makes a difference. Um, what, another company that um, I, I work with um, that I've done for a gazillion years, even before Walmart Open Call in my previous life, um, they were about education. So even though their products um, were about growing your own food um, in food deserts and so forth, they wanted to bring their story and and their product to schools and um, show show students that they can actually grow their own food, even though they live in the city or they live in an apartment or whatever it happens to be. So those are the kinds of stories that make the difference. Stephen talked about um, how their products came together, how their company came together, the founders and what that story was like. That journey and sharing that journey um, set you apart from everybody else. So your product is really great, but that's not the whole story. You're a part of the story too. So make sure that you tell that story. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing that, Joanne. Storytelling is so important. And we always say that your story is unique to yourself and no one has the same story as you do. So it's so important when you're building anything, a company, a product, um, you have to tie your story into it to make it unique. Uh, what about you, Stephen? What advice do you have for entrepreneurs who are trying to get their product on Walmart shelves? Yeah, first of all, 100% agree with Joanne um, and everything you all have said about storytelling. That is probably the bit, like the most important skill for uh, starting out as an entrepreneur um, outside of getting into Walmart, but even for just like getting really anywhere, uh, getting started anywhere with investors, with your first stores or your first sales. Um, so definitely agree on the storytelling piece. Um, I think getting into Walmart and getting into similar stores, um, it seems like a really insurmountable challenge. I think when you're starting out like Walmart, it seems crazy to get into Walmart. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like what Joanne said, like you can, sometimes you can just go into the store and ask for a store manager and ask them, Hey, where you be, would you be interested in listening to like a pitch about my product? Would you be interested in trying something I have to offer? Um, I think the, the first barrier is to just overcome the, the seemingly seeming difficulty of getting into Walmart and just like try at the ground level with a store manager and start small. Um, I think on a bigger, bigger picture level, if you're doing something like an open call where you have the opportunity to get into front of a, a lot of decision makers all at once. Um, one thing I would, would advise is to think about like, what does Walmart want? It's, it's not all about you, right? It's not about your product. Your product might be the greatest product in the world to you, but it needs to fit uh, into Walmart's portfolio somehow and make sense for Walmart somehow. And it it would be it would be uh, good to think about you know what the other party wants, what the person that you're selling to wants, um, and what's interesting to them. So with with Open Call, for example, Walmart is telling you that they care about U.S. manufacturing. They're telling you that they they care about diversity on their shelves, and so. Um, the way you position your product and the way you talk about your product should really fit into that. Um, and so uh, I would say definitely tell your story and tell it authentically, but also at the same time, while you're doing that, what parts of your story fit into um, something that Walmart cares about um, and why does it make sense for them to carry your product amongst the literally thousands of other pitches that they're going to get. Um, so thinking about it from their perspective, I think is, is something that will help you a lot. Um, and then after that, just prepare. I think prep for us, like preparation is really everything and practice over and over. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and when you're dealing with a specific specific you know consumer market or um, demographic, I feel like Walmart would know exactly who their demographic is, right? And has to align with their vision right. um, and you know values and everything like that. So really, it's really good to know that they're willing to um, kind of go with you along the way to provide advice and tips on how to best, you know, go about your pitch. So really good to know that um, for anyone who's interested in the Walmart open call. Um, okay, so Stephen, we're nearing the end of the call and just wanted to see if you had any last remarks and for our listeners to know where can they find more 
about Drunk Fruit um, and where can they buy it. You can learn more on Instagram. Our handle's at Drunk Fruit. And for our sister brand, Yoju, the handle's at Sip Yoju. And if you go to stores, you can find it at places like Walmart, Whole Foods, and Total Wines across California and the D.C. areas. Amazing. And... Yeah, of course. And just wanted to mention, they're all amazing. Like they taste so good. Brian and I have tried drunk fruit and yoju. Um, and just wanted to say your your marketing and like your packaging is just so unique. I love it so much. So just thank great you. job on that. And uh, for any of the listeners, go try it out. Stephen and Joanne, thank you so much for being on this podcast today. Had an amazing time just learning about both of your, uh, Stephen, your journey and Joanne, your tips and tricks on how to get on Walmart Open Call. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Again, thank you. If you're an entrepreneur, uh, check out Walmart. Definitely get your product list there and reach out to Joanne. I uh, really highly, highly recommend that. So thank you guys so much for your time today. And uh, thank you guys for listening to the podcast today. Bye, everyone.